Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my talk is called How to Set Up a Tour Relay on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm Kendall Wirtz. Hi, this is the one good picture of me that I've taken in the past 10 years. Um, I am married with two kids. I'm the president of Techlahoma. I used to be a chemical engineer. I was a chemical engineer with, for 10 years, um, but I always wanted to be a developer. And so about a year and a half ago, I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Um, and I am now a full stack developer for Bayer Crop Sciences. I also like to bake and make beer. See, I'm well-rounded. I have all of the things. So today, uh, the talk is about building a tour relay on a Raspberry Pi. Um, but I thought I'd go in a little bit, go into tour a little bit and explain what tour is and how tour works and why it's not most, most, it's mostly not evil. Um, so tour stands for the onion router, which I didn't know for a long time, maybe five years, I don't know. Um, but it's called an onion router because of the way that it works. Um, it is a browser. Um, you can use the service other ways as well, um, but the browser is probably the most accessible way. It enables anonymous communication over the internet, and it, it does this by bouncing traffic through relays all over the world to give you more privacy. Um, now, I really wanted to find, and if, if this is a thing, please tell me. I swear I've seen a movie or a TV show where they show uh, they're tracking internet traffic, or maybe they're tracking some cell signal, I don't remember, and they see it bounce to one server and then to another server and then to another server. I really wanted to find that video and play it for you. Um, and I searched for a while, but I couldn't find it. Um, but that's basically what Tor is, um, that concept. So you'll have an entry node, which is where I am. Well, not necessarily. We'll say this green dot is my computer. Um, and then it will, uh, my computer will encrypt the traffic and send it to an entry node uh, somewhere within the Tor network. Um, and then it'll bounce around on different Tor servers until it comes out at an exit node and then uses that exit node to go where I want to go. And so people at the exit node won't know where I am or where I'm coming from. Um, and, and nowhere along the line of traffic do people get to see my, get to see my internet traffic. Um, so this is an example with computers, not the default map that I found in this slide deck theme. Um, but so this is my computer. These plus signs are all Tor relays. Um, you can, the service will pick a path for the relays. Um, and then at the exit node, you'll access the, uh, the server and the information that you, that you want to know. Um, yeah, and so the red is unencrypted and the green are all encrypted. But I don't need privacy. I have nothing to hide. Aha, this is where you're wrong. And I've lost my slides, one second. Um, oops, you all have bathroom doors, right? Um, sometimes you just want to hide things. Uh, you may want to look up some information on a disease that you're worried that you might have, or you may want to look up some information about your kids that you don't want the whole of the internet knowing about. Um, you may have heard the story about a teenager whose father came into Target yelling at the manager, complaining that Target had sent his daughter, who was like 14 or 15 or something, coupons for, uh, for baby products. <laughs> And he was very angry because she's, she's underage, she's a teenager. Why are you sending her these baby product coupons? Are you trying to encourage her to have sex or something? Um, and the, and the you know, Target you know, doesn't know what's going on. Of course, the manager of the store doesn't. But eventually, uh, it comes out that the, uh, as I understand it, the, <clears throat> the people who work for Target tried to figure out why this teenager was sent these coupons and it's just the things that she searches for uh put her into a little bucket 
where Target's algorithm recommended uh, that she get sent baby product coupons. And the reason that worked is because the girl was actually pregnant and she was <laughs> searching for things like uh, moisturizer to prevent uh, uh, stretch marks and things like this. And so um, things that you don't necessarily want uh, everyone to know uh, are going to end up in your search history. So things like Tor and other services like DuckDuckGo, which hide your search your search history and don't sell it to advertisers, um, protect you from stuff like this. All right, so now you all agree that you need privacy, right? By the way, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to jump in. Just turn your mic on and I just ruined my little thing there. Okay, so what is Tor used for? Julia is, I think Julia is laughing or maybe her screen is just shaking, but I, I hope you find this entertaining, Julia. Uh, what is Tor used for? So it keeps your internet traffic hidden, like we talked about, from advertisers, but also from your internet service pr provider. You may not know this, but Cox or whoever is your internet service provider can sell your, your data. It knows every single site that you go to, more or less. It doesn't know your password. It doesn't know how much money's in your bank account, but it knows the URL of every website you go to. So if you go to uh, Amazon and you look for a certain product and that the URL can be matched to something. Um, so your internet service provider knows a lot about you um, and they can now sell that data to people. <coughs> Uh, also, political activists use it, um, and people circumventing government censorship also use it, um, whistleblowers and journalists, and the U.S. military and intelligence organizations. Um, so it's used for a lot, of, uh, a lot of things. It's also used for hacking, uh, black market drugs, fraud, counterfeit operations, and all kinds of other bad stuff. But, um, but I, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of people, the items on the left are important and need to be, and need to be upheld. So, you know, yes, watch out, but bad things happen on tour, but, uh, that doesn't make it bad. So I wanted to show you real fast how tour protects your privacy using a An example from the EFF, which is really cool. Let me share it, please. There it is. They have this really cool graphic um, on the EFF's website. It's EFF.org. Um, and it's, uh, if you search Tor and HTTPS EFF, you'll find it. But basically this shows you how your internet traffic goes from you to uh, whatever you're using, site.com, Facebook, whatever. Um, so with no Tor and no HTTPS, um, it goes along this line, it goes to the ISP, it goes to the site's ISP, and then it ends up at site.com. And these little boxes, which might be too small for you to see actually, show you all the data that every single person along this line can see. So, so on your computer, you know your username and password, you know what site you're going to, you know what data you're sending, and you know your location. If you're not using any security, the hacker at the coffee shop that you're at knows all of that information. All of the employees at your ISP know all of that information. The people who are snooping on you um, and looking at your internet traffic, you know, out on the web, they can see all of your information. Uh, the ISP of the site can see your information and everybody at site.com can see all of your information. Um, if you turn HTTPS on, Again, your ISP can see what site you're going to. They can see where you are and uh, they can see your IP address. Um, and so can most people out on the internet and at site.com, they still have all of your information and they know where you are. They have your IP address. Now, if you're using Tor, um, the hacker knows where you are, obviously, because he's at the same coffee shop you're at. Uh, but he doesn't have any of your information because it's all encrypted. Um, your ISP, they have your IP address, obviously, but they know you're over tour and they don't know anything else. They don't know what site you're visiting. They don't know anything. Um, the people on the internet who are snooping, 
they don't know uh, until you get to tour. Uh, all they know is that you're using tour on tour. Uh, your location is hidden. Everything is encrypted um, at your exit relay. Um, the, the site gets the information that it needs username, password, data. Um, and then, but they don't know where you're from. Like the site doesn't have informa any information on your location. It doesn't have your IP address. All it knows is you came out of Tor and you came from this Tor relay and that's all it knows. Um, now, if you're using Tor and HTTPS, your username and password will be encrypted as well as everything that goes over the Tor network will be encrypted. So um, nobody can, find, can see your username and password as long as you're using HTTPS. You should always use HTTPS. Um, and then if you're also using Tor on top of that, everything is encrypted from your computer on. And so nobody knows where you're coming from as well. So the site over here, that's my favorite part, is the site doesn't know. Uh, even if you used Facebook or something, like it would still know who you are because you logged into Facebook with your username and password. But it wouldn't know where you're coming from. You could be coming from uh, Russia or Africa or anywhere. So that's a really cool graphic. You should go check it out. And then I'll go back to the presentation. We have one question so far while you're getting that ready. Oh, and go for it. I didn't even this look This might be that. something that you are going to talk about. Um, but from Hong, can Tor help with Internet of Things security? So specifically IoT security? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, it could if you set it up to use Tor. I don't, it depends on like what type of thing you're using. If you're using something that's very open source, you might be able to set it up. Like you can actually run a website on the Tor network like that is inaccessible outside of Tor. Um, oh, yeah. It's called a dot .onion website. Um, and if you can set up your IoT items in your house to be running on on a dot .onion address, that might, that might work. Um, but if it's like something from Samsung or something, I don't, I don't think it's going to help much. Um, it's, oh, it's really up to the security of, of the device itself and the manufacturer if it's not like an open source technology. Um, but a shameless plug for Mozilla, they always publish a, um, a every year they publish like a buying guide that that sort of rates how secure certain items are. And a lot of the items they look yeah. at are going to be Internet of Things type type items. So, Okay, that's good to know. And it looks like uh, Diana posted a darknet concepts for IoT security of things. So, so fun reading for afterwards. That's exciting. All right. Thank you, Kendall. Right, let's share this. Where is it? Oh, this one. All right, back to the presentation, yes? Okay. So, what's a relay? It's not this, that's, that's not the kind. Um, all of the computers in between are the, are the relays. So, um, and that's what, that's what I decided to build because the more relays the Tor network has, the stronger it is. Um, the more the more places you can jump to to move your signal around, the more protected journalists and polit political activists are, right? Um, so there are three different types of relays. There is a guard and middle relay. There's an exit relay, and there's a relay called a bridge. Um, guard and middle relays are anything but an exit relay. So these are both guard. These could both be guard and middle relays, um, and you basically tell when you set up the relay you tell it whether or not you want to be an exit relay because exit relays um can be a little bit of uh, a pain uh yeah sorry i'm looking at my speaker notes um exit relays are where you get into trouble so tor does not recommend that you run an exit relay for from home because all of the traffic that comes out of an exit relay is un is unencrypted uh, from Tor. And so if someone is going on to Tor to download, I don't know, 
happy Gilmore or something and your ISP sees that and flags it. I don't know, surely none of you have ever downloaded anything uh, and been flagged by your ISP. I certainly have not, um, and certainly not more than once. Um, but all of that traffic is gonna be seen by your ISP, and so if that's coming from your exit node and your exit node is at your home, Cox is gonna think that's you. And that's, you know, obviously that's not you, but you're still gonna get in trouble for it. So don't run an exit relay from home, but I think the, the basic install is not, oops, not an exit relay. It's a guard or a middle relay. Um, the third, so basically you run an exit relay from like a, a server somewhere and people often pay money to run exit relays because they're just good people. Ah, okay, so, and then third type is a bridge. And I don't know how to set up a bridge, um, but bridges are basically just secret entry nodes. So all these guard and middle and exit relays are all published. And so like you can, if you have a website that's like getting a lot of attacks from Tor, uh, oftentimes places will just shut down all traffic from Tor. Um, and countries that that um, are censoring things like Tor, censoring the internet and things like Tor, will just shut down access to all IPs that are listed under Tor. And so what a bridge does, it's, it's basically just a secret list of entry nodes so that if you live in one of those countries where those are blocked, you can, uh, you can find, I don't know how, but you find a secret list of, of bridges and you use those as entry nodes instead. So let's make a relay. Um, the outline of what I did is at my website, kendallworks.com. You don't have to type in that whole address. It's the first article. There's only like three, three posts on that whole website. So um, if you want to check it out, you can go look at it and you can follow along if you want. Um, so the first thing you need is a Raspberry Pi. I bought one like four years ago and it sat in a drawer and I did nothing with it four years. I, I think that's a prerequisite for doing a project on a Raspberry Pi. I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, I think you got to let it sit. And you got to let it age, you know, just, I'm a comedian. I'm so funny. Um, <laughs> so a Raspberry Pi is just a teeny tiny computer. It's literally like this big, and I'm mad because I was going to, we have two, and I was going to get the other one and bring it in here as a little... No, I don't think it's here. Uh, it's, they're small. They're like this big. You can see it's in his hand. Um, and we got, I got a kit uh, from Adafruit that has everything in it that you need. It has the, uh, it's got a charger. It's got a little case. Um, it's got an SD card. Um, these basically won't work without a charger and an SD card. Uh, I think that's probably the minimum thing you need. Um, but when you get it, make sure it's working. Uh, plug it in. Depending on what model you have, um, the lights flashing on it will tell you if there's something wrong with it or if you need to upgrade the OS or if your power supply isn't good enough, things like that. Um, um, and then make sure, oops, I need to stop clicking. Make sure the OS is installed. Um, I, that's, I think the problem I ran into when I I actually tried to do this like two or three years ago when I first got the, the Pi, um, I, uh, I tried to install a new OS on it and I did, I didn't have a keyboard and mouse. I didn't have an extra keyboard and mouse at home or keyboard and monitor rather, um, at home. And so I was trying to do everything headlessly and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the dang thing because, it wouldn't boot up to tell me, you know, you have to get it to boot up to be able to SSH into it and, and uh, look at it without a monitor. Um, but uh, I couldn't get it to work and that's why it sat in a drawer for four years. So definitely recommend having a monitor and keyboard handy. Um, yeah. Uh, and then make sure you change the default password, especially if you're going to use it as a Tor relay, change the default password. 
Okay, but once you have your OS installed, I just use the regular, uh, the default, I think it's called Raspbian is the default OS. Uh, and I use that. And then once you get it all set up, you can turn off the GUI part of it. So it's not bothering to boot up a GUI and run a, run a graphics environment. Um, so we can just focus on Tor. All right. Uh, the next complicated thing was setting up and this isn't that, I said complicated. It's not that complicated. It's just the part that caused me the most problems um, and I bet is most likely to cause you the most problems if you're doing this from home, um, is to set up a static IP and um, open up ports on your router for port forwarding. So uh, here's a beautiful image I stole off the internet of, no, okay, of, um, a router setup, but basically the router is blocking a lot of stuff that comes into to, uh, your network. Um, and only, only things on, I can't remember what port it is, but one certain port are allowed to come in probably right now if you, were set, if you have it set up to the default. So, um, or maybe no ports, I don't know. Anyway, uh, you have to open up specific ports to get this to work. So the setup I used used ports 443 and 8080 um, to, uh, to run Tor. So let's pretend this little laptop is the Raspberry Pi, which uh, it's not. So, so basically something would come in to your Cox IP address at port 443 or 8080. And your router would say, hell no, that's not coming through. That looks sketchy. It's looking for, it's asking for a port, which we don't have open. And so your router would block it. So what you do is you tell your router, hey, my Raspberry Pi is gonna be at this IP address and it's never gonna change. Um, and if, you, by the way, if you get anything on port 443 or 8080, I want that and I want you to send it to my Raspberry Pi. So it'll, that's called port forwarding and it just, um, it just takes that traffic and sends it directly to your Raspberry Pi. Let's see, did I cover everything? Forward request from your internet to your Raspberry Pi. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's hard to tell if you have this set up correctly until you actually get everything ready and Tor installed and you're ready to go and you hit go. And you hit go and it doesn't work. And you're like, well, crap, what did I do? It's usually something in this stack or it was for me anyway. Um, yeah. So next, install scripts. There has to be a cat in every presentation, I think. I think that's a rule. Um, on my website, I link to some instructions that I use for installing Tor and configuring Tor. This guy, uh, I'm sorry, that was horrible. This person uh, wrote some scripts that um, do a bunch of things for you automatically, so you don't have to worry about it, which is great. Um, but they update everything on the Pi. All the all the software you have insta installed, it'll do an update, and it also sets it to get automatic updates. Um, because it, I have a headless setup and it's plugged in in my living room, and I'm theoretically never going to look at it again. Uh, it would be good for it to do its own updates if it can. Um, it also installs the Tor software and it configures Tor for those ports that we talked about earlier. And it rejects the exit node, which is what you want if you're doing it from home. And it creates a config file that you need to update. Uh, and it also configures port forwarding on those same ports. So it handles all of that for you, which is, which is great. But I will say, if you do run a script on a computer that you found on GitHub, make sure you read through it first. <laughs> Make sure you read through first, that's all. <laughs> Make sure you know what it's doing and don't just run a random script you found on GitHub. Anyway, let's see. All right, so after you do that, you update the config file. So um, you go in, um, you uh, nickname, oh gosh, of course I can't click it. You nickname your uh, relay. Mine is called Kendall on Tor. Um, on second thought, maybe shouldn't have used my first name, but too late now. Um, you add an email address. This is a pub, 
a published email address that people can find. So you may not want to use your gmail.com address or whatever, but you also want to have access to this um, because if there's something wrong with the, with the relay, they're going to email you about it um, here, apparently. I haven't gotten any emails yet. Um, so I use a Firefox relay address, which forwards to my Gmail account. And if it ever gets uh, annoying or spammy or whatever, I can just shut it off. Um, and then the uh, configuration script that we ran on the last slide will set this po these ports for you. Um, and then something that you're going to want to look at, it'll also set this sock stuff and the exit node reject, which is to turn off the exit nodes. Um, sets where your log files are, and it makes it run as, as a daemon, which is in, it runs in the background. So you don't have to tell it to run. It just automatically starts running or automatically keeps running. Um, and then the other thing you want to set is the relay bandwidth rate and the relay bandwidth burst. Um, so as I understand it, if you are con like topping out your upload speed with Cox, they're gonna, they're gonna, they might get a little upset and they might come talk to you about that. So what um, I did and what I've read to do is to go to like fast.com or someplace that measures your download and upload speed. Um, and not your download speed, that's the main one that people are mostly usually worried about, but your upload speed is what you care about here. You measure your upload speed on a day, I guess, that feels average. I don't know. Um, and then you, that's in, usually that's in megabits per second. So you have to convert it to kilobytes per second. Um, um, so you don't want to give it, th this basically tells the relay, this is how much bandwidth you can have and you can't have any more. Uh, the rate is the average and then the burst is, oh, every now and then you can have up to this. But you can't have any more than that. Um, so you probably want your burst at like, I don't know, maybe half of what your upload rate usually is. I think these were the default settings that came with, um, uh, that came in the config file. So uh, it, they worked for me and I'm using Cox Internet in basically Broken Arrow. So it's not, it's not too speedy, but, but it'll work. Okay. We did email address, we did nickname, and we did the bandwidth limits. That's everything we need to talk about on that slide. All right, then you confirm it's working. Um, so you can tell your logs and it will literally tell you, you know, if you're having a port, if it looks like you're having a port problem, it will literally tell you that in the logs. We'll be like, um, are you sure your ports are open? Or I don't remember what the message is, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if it's working, it'll be like, hey, success, it worked. Um, so that's really helpful. And then, and that'll happen immediately once you've started it, the service. Um, and then after a few hours, you can actually look yourself up on metrics, uh, on the node search. So let's go find me. Is it? Yeah. So this is me. This is my Tor at home, or my note at my relay at home. Kendall on Tor. There's me. Uh, that's my crazy email address. Um, there's the exit reject policy, so that you know it's not not an exit node. Cool, and then this shows you <clears throat> how much use it's gotten. Um, so you will find that, let's make it a little older than, so this has only been up but for like, I don't know, not even two months, I think. Um, so you'll find that at first you won't get a lot of traffic, but the longer it's on tour, the more traffic you'll get. So I guess it, I don't know how it works, but I'm assuming Tor just gives new re relays a little time to to test them out until it starts using them, you know, full throttle. So, so that's my graph. I'm very proud. It's gone up over time, and I every time I check it, it's still up. It makes me happy. Um, okay. Okay, 
All right, so we've confirmed it's working. All right, the next stuff, these are optional things. Um, this just talks about how I, um, I sort of talked about this already, but um, I set it up with Raspbian OS, which has a, as a GUI. Um, and so once it was all set up and ready to go, you can turn the GUI off. So it won't boot up into the, into the GUI. It'll, it'll boot up into a command line interface. Um, so that probably is a good thing to do. Um, you can also add, um, oops, uh, SSH. You have to turn SSH on in Raspbian OS um, so that you can log in remotely. So right now it's, it's plugged in behind my entertainment center, you know, right next to my router. No monitors to speak up nearby. So if I want to look at it, and actually... Let's go look at it. Why aren't you working? Come on, Zoom, be cool. So if I wanna go see how it's doing, um, I can SSH into it. Um, and then the other thing that's on this slide that you can't see anymore is uh, Nix. So Nix is another way to tell, to see how, how the relay is doing, if it's, if it's working, if it's running. Oh gosh. Um, so you can see here that there's, a, oh, that's that. Let's try this again. That's better. Um, so you can see here that there's movement, that it's it's receiving it's downloading and uploading things, so you know that it's working. Um, that's the only thing I use Nix for. I'm sure you can use it for a lot more cooler things, but I haven't really messed with that yet. Basically, just reassurance that it's actually doing what what I thought it was doing. All right, so. Um, if you want to mess with Nix, it's nix.torproject.org. And yes, this is the Headless Horseman because you're, anyway. <laughs> um, that is it. If there are any questions, I see there's one question. Could you recommend some websites to learn about Tor? Yeah. Um, Torproject.org is a really good one. It's just the website of the Tor project. They have a lot of informational. Uh, they have a lot of information, and and they want you to run a relay, so they're very clear about you know what the risks are, and um, and they're like it's it's their recommendation recommendation not to run an exit relay from home. So they're they're looking out for you. They want you to be safe, and um, but they want you to also help out with the Tor project. So. Let's see. There we go. That's torproject.org. <clears throat> um, they've got good stuff. It'll tell you all about um, relays and um, how Tor works and all kinds of stuff. Was it Tor Project where you found the specific Raspberry Pi setup information? Um, I actually uh, searched for a few things. Like, yes, you can get um, – there. there is a procedure on how to set up a Tor Relay on, um, on torproject.org. That's not the one I use, though, because um, it, it's, it's actually – you could probably just do that. You could probably just follow that um, procedure. I just use the scripts because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I did. There, there is, and let's see, my website actually has a link to the. You can follow the official tour documentation. Here it is. Nope, that's not the right button. 
so there's a tour wiki that has a tour relay guide um and it tells you how to install it um the scripts and the 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 one i use were more specific to a raspberry pi because since the computer has to always be running or it doesn't have to always be running but the relay is more reliable and Tor starts using it more if it's always running, right? And so you could run it on like your laptop, um, but it's only going to be running when your laptop's open and connected and also slow your laptop down. So like for me, this was like uh, not just, oh, I, you know, I want to do this cool thing on a Raspberry Pi. It was like, oh, I want to contribute to Tor because I think it's important. Okay. Um, and so instead of just, you know, running it on my laptop, I was like, I want something that is in my house that is always running tour. So, and I'll keep running it until that Cox comes knocking on my door. <laughs> um, so for my understanding, um, so then from your house, if you're on the internet, you're still not tour browsing unless you actually are in a Tor browser. Like this doesn't affect all traffic to your house. It's just adding another node to the Tor network. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So I didn't talk about that at all, but you can download the Tor browser and uh, let's see, here it is right here. Let's try this one. So this is the Tor browser. It's, um, it's built on Firefox something. It's the stable version of Firefox. Um, so it doesn't update very often, except I probably haven't used it in a long time. So so it's running Tor right now, and it'll tell you... Uh, I don't remember. There's a website you can go to that'll tell you, oh, hey, you're on Tor. Or, um, But every time you open it up, it'll log in and connect you. TechTorProject.org. Here we go. Congratulations. This browser is configured to use Tor. Your IP appears to be 185, which is not my IP. That's, I don't know where that is. Let's find out. Oops. Every time. Oh, it's in Germany, it looks like. Maybe not. That's the thing is, uh, look up, here we go. Um, so I was wondering, like, if, if the Tor nodes are hidden in the Tor network, like, do, do any of their IPs really show up where they are? So the, you'll have the IP of the exit node. So this exit node is oh, in... Okay. I don't know. It doesn't say. Oh, it is in Germany. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and if you ask Google, like, where am I or yeah. something, I don't, I'm assuming you can do that, but it'll tell you that, that you're in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times things will show up in German because. Oh, it, yeah. Yeah. Like all my, all the Google stuff is. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> Yeah, so it thinks I'm in Germany. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Well, that's fun. Any other questions? No question, but I think it'd be fun to just randomly hit uh, exit nodes and plan a vacation that way. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> just visiting my best friends <laughs> taking the heat from me <laughs> <laughs> alright I'm going to stop recording then